In this video, we'll talk about how to update your Ubuntu system, how to install Ubuntu Server 10.10, .10, how to install SSH and use SSH to log in to a remote computer as well as to securely copy files back and forth, and how to configure your network. For this video, I'm assuming that you installed Ubuntu 10.04 or 10.10 server. Let's look at how to update the system. To update the system, we use the command aptitude. Aptitude is a package manager. The first command we want to run, we want to update our system, is to run sudo aptitude and then update. What the update command does is downloads the updated package descriptions from the Ubuntu software repository. This should only take a few seconds. The next command that we run, which actually does or performs the uh, upgrade, is called sudo aptitude safe upgrade. What this does is it compares the information that was downloaded from the Ubuntu software repository using update and compares it with the existing and installed lists of applications and files. If there's anything that needs to be updated, aptitude will download those files first and then it will replace those outdated packages. First, let's walk through the steps of how you would install Ubuntu Server. We're going to select New Virtual Machine. We want to select Custom or Advanced. We want to hit Next here. And we want to install from an ISO. And what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to perform an easy install, which means that during the installation of server, we don't get any, asked any questions. And so we go and we find our file. Here's our Ubuntu 10.10 server. That's the new version. Notice that I'm installing the 64-bit version, but that's because I have that capability for the computer on which I'm installing it. We click Open, and then we can click Next. Notice that VMware has determined that we're trying to install Ubuntu 64-bit server 10.10. And we want to give our full name, our username, and our password, and make sure it's something that's easy to remember. And of course, with installing any of the other Linuxes, is that this account, PC for me, will be allowed to run as root using the sudo command. We want to give it a name that's memorable. I'm going to call this server. And we hit next. Number of processors is one. And I have a, I believe a quad core machine. Let's see two, let's do there, it's only got dual core. And you notice that it's only asking for 512 megabytes of RAM. <clears throat> and actually, this should run well with 500 megabytes of RAM because Ubuntu Server does not configure or install a graphical user interface. Everything is done from the command line. So we're going to keep that at 512. We can use network ad address translation for now. A little later, we'll change that. We want to go with the recommendations here. I'm going to create a new virtual disk. I'm going to go with a recommendation for SCSI here. And we don't want that large of a uh, disk, at least I don't, because I have probably about eight or nine different VMs on here. So we'll go with five. Five gigabytes. We'll click next. Uh, we want to this is our virtual machine disk named server. That's fine. Click next. Want to make sure we've got everything in here that we need. Everything is correct. That's good. And we hit finish. And now the installation proceeds. Notice that we don't get that usual splash screen as we do.
and now it should proceed as normal. Notice it just says easy install is installing Ubuntu 64 and that's because VMware saw that we were installing um, Ubuntu so we can go in and make all the appropriate accommodations and I'm going to pause this just for a few minutes while it installs. It shouldn't take long. and the software has been installed and now Grub, the bootloader, is being installed. The installation is finishing, should be shortly, and the system is rebooting now. and that when we reboot we will be rebooting into a command line, just a terminal. And notice because we did an easy install that VMware Tools is being installed in our system, so we want to wait a few minutes while that is updated. And I'll pause again. and VMware Tools has been installed and I'm at the login screen. Remember, in order to type commands within VMware, you have to have the focus, so you make sure you click in the VM. If you want to remove focus, you hit Control-Alt and you get your pointer back. Let's make this a little bigger. And let's log in. And we're logged in to our server. So the first thing we want to do is type clear. And let's go ahead and let's update our system. So we type sudo aptitude update. Ask for a password is root. And now very quickly, notice that aptitude downloaded from the software repository all of the package information for server. Now we can update our system using aptitude, safe upgrade. It indicates there's just a small number of packages to update, including a new kernel and open SSL. And so notice here do you want to continue? Notice that the Y is capitalized. That means that's the default if you just hit enter. So you can type Y or just hit enter for yes. And now it's going to take a few minutes to download the information and then install. I'll let this run just for a few seconds so you see how quickly this occurs. It tells you the, the percent of the package that is downloaded thus far, 8%, 9%. The speed at which it's downloading, as well as the amount of time remaining for this particular file. Notice here, the percentage indicates the percentage of time for the entire installation, so we're at about 28% right now. And I'll pause. And so it's downloaded all the files, and now it's installing them. And it's installed it in about five minutes, and we're back at the command line. And we've got a newly updated system. Now let's look at Secure Shell. And I'm using this first because um, it's a very important tool that you'll be using as a Linux IT administrator. And also, it allows us to, uh, to get an example of how to go ahead and use Aptitude to install an application as well as determining what network services are running. So Secure Shell is a replacement for Telnet and for FTP. Telnet and FTP are security vulnerability have security vulnerabilities because they pass username and passwords 
in plain text, which means if somebody is listening in on the network traffic, is that they can get your username and your password. Secure Shell uses public private key encryption to communicate between computers, so all communications between the computers is encrypted. And it uses high grade encryption and a key exchange between the computers. So instead of using Telnet or FTP, we always want to make sure that we use SSH to, to connect between computers. There is also the ability to copy files from a computer to another using the copy facility within SSH, which is called SCP for secure copy. So the so the syntax to copy, and we won't do this now, but we will shortly, is secure copy and the list of the files to copies or directories, followed by the username at the IP address where you want to upload the files, followed by, and this is incorrect because they're right in here, there should be a colon and then a dot and a forward slash. The colon is the delimiter indicating this is the end of the username and IP address and then the dot and the forward slash means copy this to my home folder. So now let's look and see how we would go about installing SSH. The SSH is provided by OpenSSH-Server, which comes from the OpenBSD Foundation. And OpenBSD is a flavor of Unix uh, that's based on the Berkeley standard distribution. And so to install SSH, we type sudo aptitude install followed by open SSH which provides both the server as well as the client applications needed to communicate between computers. Notice that we're going to be running this on the server and we'll see that once we we install this that the first thing it does is it generates the public private key pair that's used for encryption. Let's do that now. So we type sudo, whoops, aptitude, install, open SSH server. It asks that we're just going to install open SSH server and these dependencies. Zero package up upgraded, three to install, zero to move, zero not upgraded. It needs 409 kilobytes for these files. Do you want to continue? We type yes. And you notice now it's installing it. It's generating the keys right in here. Notice that it's actually starting the SSH daemon. And a daemon is just a process that listens for connections. And it's installed. So now we have the SSH service up and running on our computer. Let's look a little more deeply into where we can find all the other services or applications or scripts that are available to run on our server. These are found in the Etsy init.d folder or directory. And this directory holds all of the services that are available to run on the server. And there's a nice little command called service which we can use to determine which services are running currently on the server and which are not running but are available to run. So let's type sudo service which shows us a help screen which shows us all the flags that we can use with service. And let's type sudo service dash dash status dash all which you should have seen for the help screen. First let's clear the screen. Hit c .init .d. Let's look and see what we have. And these are all the services that are available to run. Notice that SSH is showing up in here. If you use another distribution of Linux, this might be called SSH.D, which would be D for daemon. And let's then type the service command. In fact, let's type sudo service. 
and you see that's the little help screen it shows you the options dash dash status dash all so let's type sudo service dash dash status dash all and let's use less with that because it'll scroll off the screen and you will see all the services if it's got a question mark that means that it is uh, installed but not running the dash means it's not installed and you see excuse me it's not running and you see the plus by the SSH which means that SSH is running if if we wanted to see just whether SSH was running we could type grep dash SSH oops uh, let's go back there and redo this we could type suit we could use status all if we just want to see SSH and you see it it points it out to us okay let's clear the screen and another way of determining what services are running what uh, demons are listening we can type netstat dash tupan and this shows us the services that are running and we see that we have two running we've got listening on port 22 the state is listening and we've also got 68 which is DHCP so we have we know that SSH is uh, listening and now let's look at how to configure our network and how to start it and stop it. The ifconfig command is used to start and stop the network and to configure your network parameters. And ifconfig is similar to the ipconfig under Windows. So let's go back over here to our server and run ifconfig. Let's clear the screen go back to our home directory I have config and it tells us quite a bit of things about our two interfaces we have our network interface card which is eth0 for ethernet 0 and usually if you only got you only have one network interface card it will be eth0 if you had two you would have an eth0 and an eth1 and so on notice it's running ethernet we see our MAC address here we see our internet 4 address 10.130.3.238 the broadcast address the mask well, we even have an internet 6 address right here notice that it says that it's up and it's running the maximum transmission unit for TCP is 1500 notice that it has both an RX and a TX and RX is the received number of packets it indicates the number of errors, which is zero, the number of drops, and so on. And the transmitted packets, say about 15,000 packets with no collisions. The number of received bytes, and the number of transmitted bytes. We've also got a network interface called LO, and that's for the loopback address. And that's used for inter-process communications where the process is running internal to your computer. Notice the internet address is 127.0.0.1. It's up and running, and it hasn't transmitted or received any packets. So you, you can use the ifconfig, or actually a wrapper for ifconfig, and that's just a script that actually uses ifconfig to either bring down your network or to bring your network back up. And the command if down is a wrapper for ifconfig that along with the the uh, network interface card name will bring down your network. And so let's clear the screen and let's try sudo if down eth0 and then let's type ifconfig and you notice that we've only got our loopback address that's running now and eth0 is down. Type clear 
and let's use IF up ETH0 to bring our network back up. Notice here that it's doing a DHCP discover on ETH0. Notice the port number 67 which is involved uh, with DHCP as well as port 68. And so we get a DHCP request. Now we see that ETH0 is now bound back to 10.130.3.238 and notice that SSH stopped and then it will start and start it again and run. And of course it wouldn't be started because ETH0 was down. So where does this information reside that's being read that actually is used to configure your network? Let's go to Etsy network. Let's clear the screen and let's look at the files that are in here. Notice that you have three directories and you also have this file called interfaces. Let's take a look at the file called interfaces. And you see it has some configuration information regarding our two interfaces. Notice that it starts out with auto loopback. Notice this is the interface name, iface, lo, and the actual uh, internet attached to this is going to be the loopback and then we've also got auto configuration of ETH0 the interface name of ETH0 and the connection is done via DHCP and so when we type IF up and IF down this file is read by IF config and automatically configures both your loopback and your network interface card. And so recall that it's the Etsy network directory and it's the interfaces file that contains this information. Also, is it a good idea to have your server to have um, an IP address that's based on DHCP? Probably not. You probably want it to have a static IP address. If you'd like to have a static IP address, you can go in and manually configure the IP address by changing the information in the interfaces file. For example, taking out those two lines for uh, ETH0 and replacing them with the following. Interface name ETH0, INET static, and then providing the IP address, and the net mask, and the gateway and then you would need to bring IF your uh, ETH0 down and then back up. It would then read the configuration information in the interfaces file and then you would have a static IP address. So now with respect to services, let's see how you would stop and start services and determine whether they were running or not. Let's go back and do the following. First we'll type service status all to see what's running. And then we'll use the service command to stop SSH. And then we'll check to make sure it's stopped by using netstat. Then we'll use service again to start SSH. And once again, use netstat to make sure that it's running. So just to make sure that SSH is running. <coughs> <coughs> type status all we see that SSH is running now let's type sudo service SSH stop no it says it stopped let's type netstat and see if it stopped and you see the only thing we've got running is DHCP Now let's use service once again to start SSH and let's use the history command to repeat command 31 to rerun netstat and we see SSH is started again. Note that you can use this uh, you can use service with any of the commands to stop them or to start them. 
Now let's turn our attention back to SSH. <clears throat> what we want to do is, is that we want to set up a local only network between the hosts uh, so they what we're trying to do is, is mimic a physical network within VMware. Let's see how to do that. Let's flip over to VMware. First thing we want to do is we want to go to Edit, Virtual Network Editor, and it's asked if we want to make a change to this computer because this does require administrative privileges. And we see we have our network editor running. Notice that we have the availability of sev several different custom um, networks in here. And what we want to do is, and notice that, that each one of these, they've got actually a couple that are running right now. We have VMNet1, which is a host only, it's connected and it's enabled. VMNet5, host only, connected and is enabled. But we can add another one here on, that's only for our VMware, our Ubuntu systems. It's only for our Ubuntu systems. So let's select VMNet3. Notice that it says it's host only. Connect VMs internally on a private network. And let's connect these to a virtual adapter in this network to VMNet3. Let's use local DHCP service to distribute the address to the VMs. Let's select that. So we've got host only, connect to host virtual adapter, VMNet3, and local DHCP service. And we see we have the subnet and the subnet mask here. Let's make this easy and let's change this to one. So it's a little easier to type. And notice this, this changes up here to the subnet address. If we want to look at the DHCP settings, we can. Network VMNet3, the subnet is .1.0, the subnet mask. And the start address, let's change that to one. Let's change this to one. And so with respect to DHCP, the first starting address is .128, and the last one will be 254. Let's click OK. Let's click Apply. Notice it's installing the host virtual adapter. It's stopping and starting the DHCP. And we've got our new host only connected and enabled virtual network. Let's click OK. And now what we need to do is, is that we need to put our server and our, um, our client, which in this case, uh, to illustrate the workings of the network, I will use Ubuntu 10, onto the VMNet3 network. So we go into VM, Settings. Notice here that the network adapter was using network address translation. Notice that here it was set at NAT. We want to select custom specific virtual network. Select VMNet3. We click OK. And now our server is using VMNet3, which is mimicking a physical network. Let's type ifconfig. And you see that we're still running the old IP address. So what we want to do is, is that we want to bring the network down, E0 down, and now we want to use DHCP to give us our 192.168.1. whatever, and we see that now we have 192.168.1. Dot 128. Let's type ifconfig. And we have our new IP address. 
Now let's go over to our Ubuntu system. Move this around a little so you can see it. There we go. And let's type I have config. Notice it's on a different network. And so we can bring the network down here. Okay, if we type I have config, whoops. That the network is down. Notice that on our GUI it says the wired network is disconnected. Let's go to sudo if up eth0. And it's using DHCP. And notice that that's not what we wanted. And we've missed one step. <clears throat> what step did we miss? Well, in, on a, under Ubuntu, we need to go back up to VM settings. Let me move this down so you can see it. And settings. And let's see what our network settings are. We're on VM Net 1. We need to change this to VM Net 3. Let's click OK. And so now both Ubuntu server and desktop should be on the correct network. We might have to bring this down first. So let's type IF config and see. And it went and DHCP went on ahead and doled the computer out to the correct network address, which is a dot one dot one twenty nine. And so we should be able to ping the other network, or the server rather. And we can. Let's go back to server. And ping the other computer. And they're on the same network. Okay, now they're on the same network, we can look at how SSH works and do a little demonstration. So from our client, which is going to be Ubuntu Desktop, we're going to type SSH, the username, at the server IP address. And let's see what happens. Let's move this up here so you can see it. And so notice that I'm logged in as PC, and I'm also PC on the server. And so that means I've got an account on there. So we're going to type SSH, and I can type PC at 192.168.1.128. Because I'm using the same account on both the server, the same username on the server, and the uh, client, I really don't need the PC. But just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to keep that there. So I hit enter. And <clears throat> we have some information right here that says the authenticity of the host, dot .128, can't be established. The RSA key fingerprint is CC1205 which is essentially a hash or a digital fingerprint of the public key from the server. And it's asking us, are you sure you want to continue? And the reason is, is if, if there's a man in the middle attack here, is that somebody else could be substituting their public key for the host public key, and we wouldn't know that. The only way we would know if this is the correct digital fingerprint or hash for the public key is to ask or to somehow contact the administrator to determine what the actual fingerprint is. So this is CC1205 and so on. Let's go back to the server and determine how we would find out what the actual key is. And one way to do this is to type SSH localhost 
It's essentially what we're doing here is we're logging in locally to the SSH server. Notice this says that the RSA key fingerprint is CC1205 and so on, and this matches the fingerprint that we saw earlier for our client system, which means it's the correct fingerprint. And so because we know it's the correct fingerprint, we know it's the correct public key, so now we can establish a trust relationship between the two computers. We can type yes. Notice this says warning, we permanently added .128 to the list of known hosts. We'll take a look at what that means in just a second. I provide my password and it closed for some reason. Let's go back and redo that. And notice that it tells us that we've logged on to Linux, Ubuntu, generic. Ubuntu 10.10, welcome to Ubuntu, and so on, because this is the first time I've logged in. And notice now I'm PC at Ubuntu. And and this is actually bad practice because the host name should be something that is different from the uh, from the other computers on your network and this is something this is just a mistake I've made so let's go back in here and let's let's clear this up let's type control C to get out of there let's clear this if you recall in one of our earlier classes is that we found a name to change uh, found a command to change our host name and that was with the host name command so we can type sudo host name and give a different host name Let's call it server. And so this isn't going to show up yet. We're actually going to have to log out and log back in for that host name to reappear. So let's log out of the system. And notice now we have the correct host name, server. Let's log back in. Clear. And now on PC at server. Let's go back over to our Ubuntu system. Let's exit. Let's log back in. And now you see I'm PC at server. I've got my bash shell. And I can run any of the commands uh, based upon the permissions that are provided by me on the server. Not on the local system, but on the server because that's what I'm connected into right now. If I would like to exit from the server, I just type exit and notice that I'm back at my client. Now recall that I said that there was something uh, called a known host file. When SSH is installed, or the first time you connect to a SSH server, it creates a directory called .ssh, which is a hidden directory. Let's go there and see the files here. Notice that it says known hosts. And let's look at that file. And what this is, is it's, the, it's actually in two parts. This first part is the encrypted IP address and it's encrypted so that somebody can't go in here and just change one of the numbers uh, one of the numbers in the IP address to try to mimic another computer and so instead it's encrypted and the rest of this is going to be the, the pri both the private key and the rest of this notice it says SSH-RSA is going to be And so the remaining part of this, notice this SSH-RSA is the fingerprint for the key. So this establishes a trust relationship between whatever IP address this was and the other computer that has its own public key. And this is the hash of the key. If we were to remove this file, 
Let's delete it, known hosts. And now it no longer exists. And let's try to go back in and connect to the server again. Notice that once again, it's, it's asking us if this is the correct key. So what it's doing is, is it because the known host file isn't there, that it doesn't know that we have a trust relationship with that. So we type yes, and go back and look at our known host file. And once again, we have our key. And once again, we have our encrypted IP address. And we have the hash of the public key. Now say we want to copy a file from the client to the server. We can find a file here. Let's uh, Let's down. Let's upload Linux files to GZ to the server, and so we can type secure copy Linux files GZ to PC at 192.168.1.128 colon dot forward slash asking for the password. Notice it indicates the name of the file copied percent copied. If it's a big file, this will be updated as it copies over the file, the size of the file, and how quickly it copied it. Let's go back over to server. Let's see what directory I'm in. Type ls. And the file was copied. Okay, let's go back and do one more example. Let's go back to our Ubuntu 10. Let's move this over here so we can see it. Let's remove that file from the local server. I mean, from, let's remove that file from our client so it no longer exists. And let's say we want to copy the file from the server back to the client. So we type secure copy PC at 192.168.1.128 and Linux files.gz. And so what this is saying is, is it log in securely to the account PC on the server and in the home directory there's a file called Linux files.tar.gz. I can't remember the exact name, but let's just go with that. And then I want to copy it. And I want to copy it here to the current directory. So I hit a period. So it says copy that file here. Hit enter. Type the name on the server. And the file was copied back. And if we want to use MD5SUM to check that it was correctly copied. See the hash of this is BC 1456393. Let's go to the server and hash that. BC 1456393. And so we correctly copied the file. And so that ends this demonstration showing how to update the system, how to update your Ubuntu system, how to install a server, how to install SSH, and an extension to install other services using Aptitude, how to manage those services, including the network.